the coordinator of the Alliance of Indian Neighbors, uh, then the group that is sponsoring this event. Uh, the Alliance of Indian Neighbors was formed about 20 years ago, and we have been meeting month monthly since then. There are about 12 neighborhoods represented, sometimes more, and they're represented by a neighborhood leader from each community. And all of the mayoral candidates here have been guests at our meetings, and we are known for asking good questions and treating our guests with respect. Uh, and I would like to thank Kay Stevenson and Martha Porter Hall for their help in making this event possible. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce our moderator, Tom Baxter. Tom was chief political correspondent for the AJC for over 30 years. He also served as editor for the Southern Political Report and has been a guest on CNN uh, for many times over the past 30 years. He lives in District 6 and currently writes a regular column for the support of the board. Please welcome our moderator for this evening's forum, Tom Baxter. She also serves as Executive Director of the City of Atlanta and Fulton County Recreation Authority. She's practiced law for more than 20 years, served as a judge in the Fulton County Court System, as a graduate of Florida A&M and Georgia State University College of Law. Vincent Fort has served in the Georgia State Senate since 1996, and uh, during a portion of that time, I believe, served as the Democratic Whip. Uh, He's a graduate of Central Connecticut State College and Atlanta University uh, and has been a professor at Morris Brown College and Morehouse College. Cesar Mitchell has served as president of the Atlanta City Council since 2009 and prior to that served eight years as a citywide councilman. Uh, he is up counsel with the global law firm of DLA Piper, a graduate of Morehouse and the University of Georgia Law School and also holds an honorary Doctor of Laws degree from Morris Brown College. Mary Norwood uh, was elected to the Atlanta City Council in 2001, representing the post two at large seat, and served there until 2009, when she ran for mayor and lost a very close runoff with Mayor Kasim Reed. Uh, she was again elected to City Council in 2013, uh, for the CYP uh, post two seat, and uh, Ms. Norwood is a graduate of Emory University. Kathy Wooler has served uh, on the Atlanta City Council and in 2001 became the first woman elected uh, City Council President. She's a graduate of the University of Georgia, 
Following college, she served in the Peace Corps as National Field Director for the Human Rights Campaign. In recent years, she has been Executive Vice President of CARE and lobbied for Planned Parenthood and Georgia Equality. Let's give all these candidates a hand. So you all need to do this in 60 seconds, right? Yeah. That's okay, just want to be clear. So it took me about an hour and 45 minutes to get here tonight from Buckhead, and to be here on time, I had to skip an event that uh, was scheduled uh, before this one. Uh, we are uh, at risk of becoming immobilized by our traffic. Uh, there are several things uh, that I believe are very important. First, we have to make sure that the once-in-a-generation rezoning of the city that the next mayor and city council will undertake is done well. We have to then integrate that with another once in a generation activity, which is the spending of $14 billion, the most amount of money available for transportation since we built MARTA. So the next mayor is going to do two once in a generation things with city council. Specifically, we need to centrally control our traffic lights. We need to have light rail, heavy rail, buses, bus rapid transit, and I have 15 seconds, so I really can't get into the details of each of those, but we need to work on every mode of transportation, and let me not forget sidewalks and, and bike lanes. So, thank you. I want to welcome to the stage Keisha Lance Bottoms, who has already been introduced. And your first question, <laughs> this is a very appropriate one. Ms. Bottoms, how long did it take you uh, uh, to get here tonight, and what did you do to improve traffic in this area? Because obviously, there is this kind of traffic every day. Well, I was just thinking somebody needs to do something about this traffic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Keisha Lance Bottoms, and I came from the south side, so I had something that ran a little late, so it took me about 45 minutes, uh, but partially my fault because I thought I was very creative in how I could get here. Um, but that being said, I think that our traffic solution really goes back to balancing out our city. I think that as we sit in one of, in a school that's doing an amazing job, in middle school, um, it really highlights where we are in terms of our school options in the city. And when you have families seeking to educate their children in quality schools, they often move to neighborhoods that have schools that are thriving. I think that when we have schools that are thriving in other communities, then you will have families willing to move to other communities. You'll have businesses willing to locate, and we need to expand our transit accordingly in each community, and the city needs to be a destination community, um, starting with good schools, which will, which really is the center of what makes each community a great success.
second reason I support it is because Mart has a plan for smaller buses going into neighborhoods. So the walk to uh, those buses is not uh, over long, uh, but we've got to uh, invest, continue to invest in mass transit as we are doing now. And two, uh, we have to also look into uh, expanding alternatives, including and very importantly, sidewalks. Well, actually, I lucked up. I actually came uh, to the neighborhood about an hour and a half early and did some canvassing because I knew the five o'clock traffic would be bad. <laughs> but it's really great to be here. A couple of things in, in 60 seconds is not enough to do this issue justice. But first of all, we have to make sure that our transit system works. So we've got to expand MARTA and make MARTA truly a doorstep to destination solution for all of us. That means partnering with broad shares and hopefully at some point uh, what you call uh, autonomous vehicles to allow for us to start our trip at our home, uh, and connect with MARTA by using some sort of ride share or autonomous vehicle, and then get uh, to where we need to go on that last mile as well. Uh, we also have to make sure that we're creating opportunities uh, for us to have workable roads uh, and bridges. Uh, sidewalks that work, bike lanes that are usable so we can commute anywhere in this city by way of a bike lane. Thirdly, we've got to have affordable housing uh, because when people can live uh, in a community uh, where they work, uh, then they can get out of their cars. I think that's incredibly important whether we're in Buckhead, Midtown, uh, Downtown, Southwest, Northwest, Southeast, uh, Northeast. Uh, we've got to be able to do that. And lastly, we've got to make sure that we're using telecommuting as well as staggered work hours so people can go to work at different times and reduce traffic on our roads. By the way, Tom, uh, it took me 20 minutes to get from West End here. So I think I beat everybody. <laughs> it took me an hour and 16 minutes um, to come from Buckhead over here. And that was using both ways and every GPS and just trying to, trying to get through. Um, we have a really a traffic crisis on our hands, and so there is so much work we have to do. When I supported the Renew Atlanta bond referendum two years ago, I my request because I'm not a district council member, so I couldn't um, allocate funds the way district council members can. But I said we've got to have traffic signalization, we've got to have a traffic command center, we've got to integrate our cameras that we have that are helping us with public safety to be managing traffic. The second thing that is so critical, yes, we've got to build out MARTA, we've got to build out the Beltline, we've got to have a regional transit system, but we also, we are going to add 800,000 new people to this town. When you look at a map, where it's green, which is where we are now, is where there's been development for the past several decades. Where it is not green is where there hasn't been development. We need to make sure that we do the connectivity throughout the whole city so those new 800,000 people are not only coming to the areas where it's green right now, that we share throughout the entire city, the new residents, and do the connectivity. Thanks. I was over in Fourth Ward at an event, so it only took me about five or ten minutes to get over here. I was pretty grateful for that because that's not always the case. Um, you know, uh, when I represented this district uh, on the Atlanta City Council, the, one of the first meetings, actually the first meeting that Ryan Gravel and I and my staff held about the Atlanta Beltline was across the street in the basement of the church. And maybe some of you were actually there when we were talking about how we could orient density around a permanent transportation infrastructure so that people could live and use transit to get where they needed to go. I'm still a firm believer in that. I uh, never stopped thinking that we should put transit on the Beltline and orient density around those corridors. I'd like to do five corridors. The Beltline, I wasn't a supporter of the streetcar, but it's a $100,000, $100 million boondoggle, so we've got to make it work. We'll connect that east to west of the Beltline and to MARTA, North Avenue to Georgia Tech, up, on, up in the northwest, north side drive and Joseph Boone across town. And that way people can start making choices as we rezone the city, as we think about how we're going to get around, so that people can live on a transit line that actually gets them where they work, or on to MARTA so that they can go further. I didn't get to talk about uh, the region or any of the other things that make it more connectable, but let's start with the framework of transit. Councilwoman Bob, let's stay with transportation for just a moment, if we could, because 
going down the line, everybody talks about the uh, problem that we have with pedestrian traffic and our sidewalks. Do you have some specific proposals for really what we could do to make uh, the streets safer for pedestrians? Yes, thank you. I believe that we have to have complete connectivity beginning with our major corridors. I think that, that, that our priority project should be around our schools and our senior uh, centers, if you will. Um, those are the places, obviously, that we are in most danger of having people who may be more vulnerable uh, to navigating pedestrian traffic, if you will. And then I think followed by our parks and recreation centers. I think that as we focus on connectivity with our sidewalks and with our paths and with our trails, it also encourages people to get out of their cars. But quite frankly, so many neighborhoods just are not connected in a meaningful way. I live in a neighborhood um, that's not connected um, in a meaningful way uh, to the most major thoroughfare, the closest thoroughfare. So I think that we have to focus and continue to partner with people like the PATH Foundation and other agencies that can help us with funding. Sidewalks are incredibly expensive, but I think that they have to continue to be a priority. Um, one of the concerns that I've had for a long time is the uh, pedestrian safety at senior citizen high rises and other residences. Uh, I know that the Housing Authority has done study on pedestrian safety at those facilities. Uh, I would expand that uh, to other senior citizen locations throughout the city that are non AHA. Uh, senior citizens are at risk in many neighborhoods, whether it be June Print 10th, Cheshire Bridge, Marion Road. Uh, they are the most vulnerable, other than children. So that would be an absolute priority for me. Uh, we're going to have to consider the city uh, taking over the construction and maintenance of sidewalks. Um, well, you could have thought that. <laughs> um, you know, if, if we are going to invest in connectivity, uh, sidewalks have to be a critical uh, part of that. So I would, uh, you know, take into consideration budgetary, uh, budgetary issues. We would have to take. Uh, the city needs to look at investing uh, in the city's maintenance and construction of more sidewalks in the city. Well, the first thing we need to do to ensure that sidewalks are safe is make sure that sidewalks actually work, that they're not crumbled up and buckled and folded. Uh, as council president, I led the charge to make sure that the city council passed legislation creating an infrastructure reserve so that we can maintain uh, all the work we do in construction and infrastructure in the city. So we've got to make sure, number one, and I agree with Senator Ford, uh, that if we construct a sidewalk, then it's going to be the city's responsibility uh, to pay for uh, any maintenance that needs to happen on that sidewalk. Uh, because your tax dollars, our tax dollars have already paid uh, for the installation and the maintenance of that sidewalk. The second thing is we've got to use bike lanes as a way to create a buffer between cars uh, and the sidewalk. Uh, so while embracing not only the idea that bicycles uh, work along our streets, we can also ensure uh, that we've got that buffer so that folks who are walking on the sidewalks are safe. Thirdly, we've got to make sure that we uh, have around every school within a mile because kids have to walk to school uh, sidewalks to allow for uh, kids to walk to school in a very safe fashion. And we need to do that in a very systematic way throughout uh, our city. I worked for a year and a half to actually get legislation passed which says that the city does have the responsibilities for sidewalks. And that came out of understanding that you had to raise almost a half million dollars in Virginia Highland to repair your sidewalks. And I felt that was fundamentally unfair because I saw that it was not equitable across the city. And the city has annual sidewalk contracts that we fund every single year. So I changed the law and the city then um, took them a while to get a prioritization table uh, as to where they would put in sidewalks. And then it's taken them a while to um, actually do that work. So the next administration needs to be very thoughtful about making sure that that happens very quickly. We have money in the teeth and the uh, Renew Atlanta bond for sidewalks, and T-SPLOS has allocated money for sidewalks. 
We need to make sure that we are doing them well and that we are also enabling people to cross the street with the signalization that actually makes the cars stop. I have seen too many people almost get hurt or killed trying to go across our streets when our cars are going time, when our cars are rushing by them. This is a great question. You know, when I was on the city council, one of the things that I did at the urging of Sally Flocks from PEDS was to write and pass legislation that would not allow developers to close sidewalks for indefinite periods of time. And we see it time and time again downtown where, you know, you're, you're walking and then suddenly a block is closed for weeks on end. So I'll enforce that. I don't have to pass it. It's already there. Um, I'd like to start a universal 25 mile an hour uh, um, uh, speed limit in in-town neighborhoods because we've got a, a variation there. I'd like to have conversations with communities about whether you'd be interested in a, in a neighborhood parking uh, fee where the, the money that's generated goes to sidewalk replacement in your neighborhood. And that would, would be all of the street parking except for people who are residents in the neighborhood and their visitors. I want to make sure that we are paying attention to ADA compliance. I'm tired of seeing people having to put their wheelchairs and not be able to get on and off sidewalks safely. It happens all the time in the city. Um, and I think that we need to be talking about traffic calming everywhere that, that we need to, especially around schools, so that at least there's visual narrowing, if not actual narrowing of streets, so that people are forced to uh, slow down. But sidewalks, having sad sidewalks at work is important, and I'd like to um, do that with some extra funding. Okay. Second floor. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's okay. I know, it's always a good, an ordering thing with, with all of us, so many of us. So the first thing I would say is that uh, it is appalling what one can see in Atlanta with sidewalks. I've seen uh, wheelchairs going down the center of the road because people can't get, even in the, in the curb, there's not usable street. Uh, so we have people in wheelchairs, we have people uh, who just cannot get around, so we have to make sidewalks a priority. Uh, a number of great suggestions have already been raised, so I'm not going to repeat what a number of others have said. The key in my mind is funding and making sure there's consistent funding each year. We do need as dedicated a revenue source as we possibly can. I think we need to look at and have a conversation around parking uh, fees and, and parking taxes for surface parking lots. Uh, there are other sources of revenue that we should consider, but at the end of the day, uh, this is also about execution. So one of the things that you have to do is pick a mayor who will make sure that we prioritize and then ruthlessly implement against that prioritization and, and you know, measure the number of feet of sidewalk we pour every week uh, and make sure that we're repairing another number of feet and just stay on top of it. Senator Ford, you're not running for a Fulton County Commission Chairman, but we have the news today that a state court has frozen the Fulton County Tax Digest. Uh, and there are a lot of us who have felt relieved that we didn't have to write our check just yet, but now we're a little uncertain as to when exactly that's going to be. What, are we in a situation uh, with the Fulton County Tax Commissioner uh, that needs to be addressed uh, in, in a more sweeping way than, than it has so far? By that I mean with the city getting involved? Uh, I, I think that the city has an interest in monitoring and getting involved at some point. Um, the, uh, but what we cannot do is kick the can down the, the road, which I think we did you know, this year with the freeze. The freeze may have been appropriate, but I think that uh, we're going to have to find solutions to the issue. Uh, one thing that I uh, think we need to keep in mind is, um, you know, the mili a military adjustment. You know, at, at the end of the day, um, the uh, the what the city, the county, and the school system uh, uh, gets in their coffers is based on a military. And I, I'm considering, I'm you know, I'm in Burlington, Vermont, of all places, they they did a automatic adjustment, military adjustment based on assessment. So those are some that's one thing that I'm considering, but we gotta stop kicking the can down the uh, road for short term gratification. We have to find a solution. 
You know, freeze is not a fix, and, and I agree with Senator Ford, we can't kick this down the road another year. Uh, we've got to grapple with it. Uh, in addition to being city council president, I actually also sit on the board of the Georgia Municipal Association. It's an organization uh, that actually advocates for strong policies for cities and people who live in cities at the state level. Uh, when this tax freeze occurred, I actually created a statewide property tax assessment task force. And that task force is going to bring forth recommendations, specific recommendations to the state legislature. As mayor, I intend to fight and advocate uh, for reforms, property tax assessment reforms, to ensure that this never happens again. And some of these reforms include increasing the exemption, uh, the homestead exemption rate, uh, looking at ways we can have measured caps, but not solid caps, ensuring that our senior citizens, uh, through partnership, uh, not just putting the burden on the school system, but through partnership with the city of Atlanta and Fulton County can provide relief uh, for senior citizens and long-term residents. Uh, the solutions are out there. We've just got to lean in together, and we've got to work hard uh, with the state legislature. I intend to do that as mayor of the city. Thank you. Um, I was the council member that, at, that got the united, did unanimous resolution through council to ask Fulton County to reject the digest because I saw that it was absolutely crippling to homeowners at every single income strata. It did not matter whether what bracket you were in, the taxes and the increase in taxes were unbelievable. 20%, 50%, 80%, 120%. <laughs> and so that is truly uh, shipping residents out of the city. So I was I asked that that happen. I went to Fulton County and then um, and, and presented that resolution to Fulton County. What we must do in the future is to have our taxes um, capped at two or three percent each year and if the taxes become um, fair market value when you sell your home. It is, it is an unrealized asset. None of us have income, produ income producing property and so it makes no sense. I have been fighting excessive taxes since 1991 which was when Fulton County raised them exorbitantly then. I'm still fighting them and will fight them now. One of the things the next mayor has to do is have a legislative package ready to go to the General Assembly in advance of getting sworn in. Because our General Assembly starts in January and they're just going to go for a couple of months. And if we don't get some reforms in place by then, what will happen is we get <clears throat> into the summer when the tax, the, the, um, tax uh, bills come out, you know, it can be at the same shop we got this time. So there's a couple things we can do right away. One is to make sure that our basic homestead exemption, which has been $30,000 a year for about as long as I can remember, is actually some number that is, is uh, reasonable in real dollars. And then it stacks then on top of homestead exemptions for seniors and then on top of that homestead exemption for people who are low income so that it really becomes a, a, a solid number. Secondly, uh, we need to have a real conversation about school tax reduction for seniors, perhaps not entirely, perhaps at you know, much later ends of life, but we need to have that conversation to see what that is. Thirdly, I want to make sure that we're not financing institutional investors who are sitting on blocks of property across the city and paying $25 a year in taxes on single family homes, and it is rampant. Um, I'm going to go to the General Assembly in that legislative package to make sure that after a couple of years, if people aren't living there, they're going to pay for their own investment. Go ahead. So we have two basic problems that have been uh, discussed and discussed and discussed uh, by many uh, lifelong politicians for many years. Uh, I remember a dozen years ago, the AJC did an expose about how broken the assessment process was in Fulton County. Uh, this is the first thing we have to fix, is the tax assessment process within Fulton County. As mayor, I will work with the tax assessor's office and Fulton County, and if that can't be resolved quickly, yes, we do need to go to the state legislature and change the process, change the law, because this has been going on for absolutely too long. We have people that are massively over-assessed, and we also have people that are massively under-assessed, and neither is fair. And this most recent round of assessments just showed that it's, it's just going to keep getting worse. So we have to figure out how to fix the assessment process. We have to get fair values for, for every house. Then we have to figure out how we get people to the fair values to the extent that are off of the fair values now, which will require some, some feathering in of those values. 
Second, we, we are forcing out of Atlanta the very people that built Atlanta. Throughout Atlanta, we are forcing people out through the increases in taxes. And so we do need to look at the homestead exemption and other tools to prevent us from forcing people out of Atlanta because of rising taxes. I've never voted to support a property tax increase. And I think that as we look at the debacle um, that was handed to many of us from Fulton County, that we do have to be concerned about what will happen next year and the year after that, et cetera. So I believe that obviously there is a need to work with Fulton County and work with our state legislators to make sure that we are not faced with this surprise as we were this year. But also we have to be creative in how we address the affordability issue in this city. I asked for the creation of displacement free zones. We've seen our first uh, rolled out in Vine City English Avenue. It's a private public partnership that has money in place to help people in the neighborhood pay rising property taxes for the next 20 years. And also there's a fund to help them fix up their houses. I think these type creative models are really what we have to look towards, especially as we're talking about our seniors um, and making sure that Atlanta is a place that everyone can continue to afford to live. Thank you. Council President Mitchell. I bet in 50 plus debates you've been asked the casino question once or twice. So I want to maybe try to give a little bit of a different spin on it tonight and ask uh, uh, if you would support a casino being developed within the city limits. And if not, what sort of, uh, what do you think is a, is, is a better alternative in terms of economic development and, and uh, development of tourism? Well, first of all, I am not diametrically opposed to a casino in the city. However, any support that I would have for a casino uh, would be contingent upon some very specific things. Uh, number one, uh, we've got a significant issue uh, with uh, early childhood education. I'd want to see money provided from casinos uh, for early childhood education and improving educational outcomes. Number two, uh, if we're going to consider casinos, uh, we certainly want to make sure that uh, they're investing in public safety, not just in the area around the casinos, but certainly throughout the entire city. There's also a significant problem if you look at cities around the country where casinos exist, where the arts and culture community is negatively impacted. Uh, if I'm going to support casinos, we've got to make sure that our arts community thrives, and there's got to be a significant, significant investment. Uh, in the arts community on the part of the casinos to ensure that uh, not only is there a partnership, but there's real investment and that our arts uh, environment still thrives and that infrastructure. So for me, it's really going to be about what will the casinos invest in the community. If there's no real investment, uh, I will not be able to support it or even consider it. I'm not a fan of casinos. I look at our city and we are on the brink of a great renaissance in our town. We have areas of the city that have seen no development for decades, and people are flocking to those areas. We're seeing people all along the Beltline coming into the city and living along areas that, that had not had new residents. We're seeing that happen, and we have some gentrification issues, but we also have an awful lot of the city that is right now ready for redevelopment, particularly along the commercial corridors. I love the new development that is going to hit south of downtown, uh, in south downtown, and I want to see the our city develop with the, the neighborhood commercial areas like Virginia Highland has, like Morningside has, like Hanover Park and Inman Park. So much of the east side can be replicated in other areas of our town. I live where everyone went to the sky with 30-story buildings. It's a very different environment. And we've now done that along our Peachtree Spine, and it is our skyline. But what makes us special are our neighborhoods and our neighborhood commercial districts. I believe that's the future of our city. And so I want to see that kind of quality come, whether it's at Turner Field, whether it's in downtown, whether it's at the Gulch, whether it's on the west side, or whether it's on the north side. I'm not a fan of the casino idea either, um, and I agree that the, the 
kind of the killer rationale for me was the study that revealed that it really decimated the arts and culture community in cities where they've been located. And we've not done much to support our arts and culture community, and we missed a gigantic opportunity uh, in the Mercedes-Benz deal and the Phillips Arena deals, because that money, the part rental tax, can only be spent on arenas, public safety, and arts and culture. It's like the only place we already had the opportunity to put a massive amount of money for a long period of time into our arts and culture organizations. And so that's where I want to start investing um, and, and uh, really try to shore that up. Because people want to come and see, have unique experiences. People want to see what the soul of Atlanta is. You know, we have let our civil rights infrastructure just crumble. And in really a decade, some, so many important structures like Pascal's Lounge is going to be gone. It, you know, the roots are gone and we just haven't made that investment. So I want to see us really spending the time to make sure that when people come here they know what Atlanta is, not just, you know, stuff that we imported from other places, like Hooters on Peachtree. <laughs> So I don't believe Atlanta needs a casino. Uh, I certainly don't believe Atlanta needs or would benefit from a casino uh, complex downtown or, or anywhere near the center of the city. I would at least have the conversation about a location, perhaps out by the airport, I would at least have that conversation uh, if we could look at a 75 to $100 million a year revenue stream, which is what I'm told uh, such an endeavor might produce. And I would have that conversation because uh, that amount of money could fundamentally alter uh, what we do around early childhood development. I'm glad uh, Council President uh, brought that up. I've, uh, I've been talking about that for a while, and it's an absolutely critical tool in breaking the cycle of, of poverty that we have in the city. You know, 40% uh, of our kids are born into poverty in this city, uh, and the best economic development tool that we have as a city is addressing those issues. So it's everything from job training to job placement to early childhood development, to a mayor who partners with the schools every single day, to transit into neighborhoods. All of these things are solutions uh, that we need to use, and we do need more balanced growth in the city. We need growth downtown and south of I-20. My mother is here today, so I get to look in her face when I say this. I prefer that she had to travel to gamble. And, <laughs> so this is a personal issue for me. Um, but I, I, I like the idea of casinos as destination places. I think there are a lot of places in Georgia that really are starved for economic development, and it's an opportunity for, them, for those places uh, to be true destination places. I think as it relates to promoting tourism, we have, uh, we rank very high in terms of the number of tourists who seek to come to Atlanta for any number of reasons, but I think that we are sorely missing a true arts and culture district in this city. On the west side in particular, I had a conversation with world-renowned artist Radcliffe Bailey, and he shared with me how many artists are seeking to live on the west side of town because it's still affordable and it's still beautiful. So I think there's an opportunity for us to create a true arts and culture district, very much in the way that underground was intended, but never quite came to be in its um, second time around, but I think we have an opportunity there. Um, at the state capitol, I did not, and as mayor, I will not uh, support casinos in the city of Atlanta um, for two reasons. One, uh, it's reverse Robin Hood. The people that uh, suffer, the people that lose their wealth um, at casinos are working people, the people least able to afford to do so. And then two, because of the impact uh, on uh, entertainment venues like the Fox. Um, people at the Fox came by the state capitol this session thoroughly on the impact of casinos on uh, in their entertainment venues on homegrown uh, venues. So I wouldn't support those two reasons. I would caution uh, my friends on the panel and everyone else uh, to read the casino legislation. Uh, the casino legislation does not allow for uh, money to be used um, on localities in cities. The, the revenue stream goes to the state capital, and so there's, there will have to be a fight. If casinos were to come about, it would have to be a fight over whether the state would share with the city. I, 
they would not want to, but uh, keep that in mind. <coughs> Normally, let's stay on this theme of arts and culture since we've, we've gotten into this conversation for a couple of questions. Uh, the growth of the film industry in Metro Atlanta has been a boom for many, and at the same time, filming can be extremely <coughs> disruptive to neighborhoods, snarling traffic, making business difficult for local merchants. Would you support funneling a portion of the fees paid by film companies back into the neighborhoods that are affected? Yes. Um, I was in Ansley Park when um, they had a presentation about two years ago. And they have a designated person who helps their neighbors um, negotiate the, uh, the, uh, what kind of arrangement that they will have uh, con and contractually and financially. And I know that neighborhoods have made sure that some of those fee that some of that money comes back to them. And so their homeowners association dues um, are non-existent because that helps in funding funding the community. So yes, and we need to make sure as um, the next administration needs to make sure that we have an open um, pipeline between the communities and the film industry so that we have better information as to when and where they want to be and we're not doing this last minute, oh my goodness, the world will fall apart if we don't authorize this permit because it does affect real people, real lives, and so the balance needs to be there. Yeah, I would too. I live in Glenwood Park and our neighborhood association has a film coordinator and negotiates directly with anybody that's going to be uh, working in our neighborhoods. I've been there 12 years. We have a homeowners association fee that's never been raised in the 12 years that I've been there. Um, and it works out well because they also facilitate communications with the neighbors. And even though we get cranky from time to time when all of our streets are shut down and it's kind of a mess, we reflect upon the fact that we haven't had a homeowners uh, increase in uh, association increase in 12 years and it's done a lot of good things for us. So I think other neighborhoods should be able to take advantage of that. But we also need from the city side to make sure that we're communicating well with neighbors uh, and we're also making sure that the film industry and the security police that are working with them understand that they are in a neighborhood and they have to understand that you know neighbors need uh, to be paid attention to and not just sort of said, you know, move out of the way, get out of the way, you know, uh, you know, you're not an impediment, this is your home. So we'll work hard on that, but I think it's a boon for our city and I think we need to just make sure that everybody's, uh, you know, happy and coordinated and benefiting from it. Yes, so I would support uh, that, that move. I also think there's a series of other things we need to do, though, to uh, really allow for the for the growth of the film industry in a way in which we can all tolerate because it does bring a lot of jobs a lot of economic development but it does bring a significant amount of burden on some neighborhoods and some neighborhoods and, and locations more than others so uh, things like uh, we should keep track of the production companies and we should allow neighborhoods and individuals to rate them you know you rate your your uber or your lyft driver there should be an easy way to file and register complaints and rate production companies and particular productions we should also make sure that the film companies are required to have a 24-hour access line so that if there's problems in the neighborhood, uh, there also should be a contact person uh, available uh, physically on site when the production is at its most active. Uh, we do need enhanced standards, I believe, of, of what they should um, provide for the neighborhood in terms of uh, movement and access. Uh, and finally, I think that there's also an opportunity to use technology here. Uh, and look at the, the delays in traffic patterns that occur with some of the larger traffic uh, or larger productions so that we make sure we really understand quantitatively what the impact is to the neighborhoods over time so we can really manage this growth. I think that, that's certainly something I would consider, but I think that the frustration that um, many neighborhoods are feeling has a lot to do with the booming industry and really the the lack of attachment, if you will, to the film industry in our communities. And I think it's important that as we look at what we are doing in film throughout the city, a lot of the talent and the people who work in this industry are coming from other places. And there's a complete community disconnect. And so I think that it's important that we have a training program, one, uh, so that we can employ people in Atlanta, in this film industry, 
And also I think that there is a certain amount of loyalty that we as Atlantans have for things that we feel are Atlantic. Are Atlanta. You think of Coca-Cola, you think of the Home Depot. But we don't have that same attachment to the film industry because most of the talent and the people who work in it come from other places. So I think that we also need to expand our office in the city of Atlanta. I've heard this complaint on both sides, neighborhoods and people in the industry, that there's one or two people, and if you can't get them on the phone, you may be hours or days before you can get a response to an issue. I would strongly consider that kind of fee to ameliorate the impact of, of filming on uh, neighborhoods. Uh, at the same time, uh, you know, we need to strongly support uh, the film industry uh, as well as the music industry in the city um, and make sure that we cooperate as best we can. I have voted for just about every tax credit the film industry has requested, including this path legislative session, a post-production uh, tax credit, um, even though there's only one company in Georgia that does film post-production, uh, we need to make sure that we train and develop post-production in the city. But in addition, um, the film industry is one thing, but the, the greatest imposition that I've heard about is the permitting of festivals. Um, particularly in the Midtown area. Uh, it's my understanding, and I've gotten calls from people in the Alliance saying that the Midtown Festival and other festivals get permits at women will. That's got to stop. We cannot allow our neighborhoods to free, be frozen uh, by festivals. We do not, I mean, what makes Atlanta great isn't skyscrapers and stadiums, it is neighborhoods and people. You know, I think about this through the lens of the experience I have with my next door neighbor. We live in historic West End, and we don't have as many films in West End as maybe in Inman Park and other parts of the town. Uh, but uh, there was a film uh, production crew that wanted to use his house, and so they offered him uh, a contract and some money uh, to actually have his house for three days. And so, you know, of course, he comes to me. I'm his neighbor who's a lawyer, and he wants to know whether or not this is a good contract. And I looked at the contract and I asked him how much were they paying him. He told me how much they were paying. I said, you definitely need to sign this contract. <laughs> <laughs> the, point make, the point I make is that they paid him a lot of money. Uh, and I was, you know, standing outside trying to market my house. <laughs> but when I'm mayor, here's what we're going to do. We're going to have a community concierge, and we're also going to have community benefits. Uh, what the community concierge is going to do is make sure that they are working with the community in advance. Uh, to make sure that the community knows, the neighborhood knows what the plans are, to make sure that they know what the timing is, to answer any questions that come up. And then number two, uh, we've got to make sure they're real community benefits, so that maybe the person who is actually, and I know my time is up, who's actually receiving uh, funds because their home is being used is not the only one that received ben received benefits. Maybe there's a park that's improved. Maybe there's some sidewalks that are improved. Maybe there's some flowers that are planted to improve and strengthen uh, the neighborhood as a result of that production. <laughs> the last question on arts and, and, uh, and uh, culture, and this came up in the last uh, round of answers, uh, but uh, as we've been sitting here, we've been getting questions written by folks in the audience, and I haven't really taken account, but it's safe to say that music midtown uh, is a subject of great uh, concern here. Uh, what can you do to uh, alleviate uh, <coughs> stress put on the Piedmont Park, the historic Fourth Ward Park, and other city parks and neighborhoods by these uh, large outdoor festivals? Uh, and in particular, is it still possible to repurpose Fort Mac or the open land uh, at Lakewood Fairgrounds as a festival site? Well, there are neighborhoods around those places too, so uh, we have to think about that. I don't think so at Fort Mac. I think that land has been essentially obligated. But um, I think we ought to really be thinking about looking at the quarry area up in the Northwest Corridor and think about having a fairground in the city of Atlanta because we, we don't.
don't have that kind of facility, but it has to be connected by MARTA. Because, you know, if we, if we move a festival like Music Midtown anywhere around sort of in-town neighborhoods, uh, at least if people can get there by MARTA, you know, you've got some options. But clearly, you can't have year after year after year these, you know, multi-week festivals that just go on and on and on and tear up the park and, you know, inflict the, the um, casualties on the neighborhoods. Um, so I think we need to get about creating a, a fairground. We've got several different uh, concepts of where that might could happen, but it, we've got to connect uh, uh, transit to it because it, otherwise you create a nightmare in another part of town. Um, so the, the other piece is, is just making sure that the parks that do absorb the load get the financial reward uh, to, to, to really fix what's going on and to further invest in those communities. Uh, so we do need to look, about, look at how we can spread the load across the city. Uh, so I do think that uh, the idea of having more places to have these festivals, festivals is absolutely an important one. Uh, we also have to look at uh, how we coordinate when we do have festivals with the neighborhoods. Uh, it would be great to have them all in some place that's connected to transit but not in the neighborhood. I, just, I don't know if that's going to be feasible in every case or suitable for every type of festival. So we certainly should look at ways where we can split, spread the load, but where we can't, where we do end up having festivals in Piedmont Park or other places which are adjacent or in neighborhoods, we need to have just much better customer service. You know, uh, My vision for the city of Atlanta is that we have ultimately, after I mayor for eight years, uh, we, we brag to our friends in other cities about how good the customer service is here from city employees. And we, we got a ways to go on that, but that would include things like festivals, uh, where the, the, the information about what streets are, are going to be open and closed and the timing of that is all very accessible, very real time, and there's lots of people on site to make sure you can you can deal with the festival. Again, I think it's about balancing out the city. I don't think any one community should bear the burden of people coming in over and over and over and over again. And I think Midtown really experiences that. Um, I'm encouraged by the Mercedes-Benz Stadium with the roof that opens. That looks like a great venue for an outdoor festival now. Uh, you look at what they do in New Orleans with the Essence Festival. They do it in the Superdome, and then they have various things in the uh, um, convention center that's next door. It's a multi-day festival. It brings millions of dollars into New Orleans each year, and it is a success. But also, two things that I did when I came on city council, I love uh, jazz music. I love to go, to go to the jazz festival in Piedmont Park. I started Jazz in the Park in John A. White Park in District 11. We now do it throughout the city. And also movies in the park. I did a movie in the park at Adams Park, and now we do them in parks throughout the city. So I think it's about encouraging people to explore other areas. Um, uh, on Midtown Music Festival in particular, it's got to be brought under control. It is a, it is a festival that is outsized for the neighborhood that it is in. So that will be a priority, making sure that it accommodates the neighborhood and not the other way around, the neighborhood accommodating a festival shutting the neighborhood down. Um, and we do need to spread the festivals around. I don't know if I would give up on Fort Mac uh, as a venue for uh, festivals. I just, I think, um, you know, and you're right, there are neighborhoods around Fort Mac, some great neighborhoods, but at the same time, it does have a MARTA stop. There are, there is, city has retained property there um, after it is uh, disposed of uh, several hundred acres to uh, a film maker. So I, I think we have to make sure that the, uh, that our festivals are brought under control that they don't make neighborhoods unlivable forever, for however long. You know, I think we gotta get uh, creative, and we gotta think outside the box, uh, experiment even a little bit, uh, and, and really find the win-win. So I think any festival using Midtown, uh, music festival as an example, uh, has to have a significant give back. And the give back can't just be to the park. It's very important that uh, the 
the park is protected, but it also needs to be a give back to the surrounding community, number one. Number two, we've got to look at uh, experimenting a little bit. Uh, one of the biggest issues around music Midtown, using it as an example, is that the amount of cars that come into the community. So maybe one year we can say, you know, this is going to be a carless festival. So you've got to go and come to the, uh, to the, uh, to the festival uh, for Mark or walk or use a bike or do something like that. Do not bring your car anywhere nearby. Uh, there are also festivals that, that actually do this around the world, and that's called uh, what you call silent festivals. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of that, where everyone wears a headphone and you hear no sound if you're not having a car. Uh, that's something we should experiment with. And then thirdly, I agree, we've got a little bit of the spaces around the city. Uh, we've got hundreds of acres in the southeast of the old prison farm. That could be a place where we can have world-class festivals uh, in an area where there's not a lot of folks and we have access to 285 to get there and do it in a way that everyone can do. Well, I participated in several of the community meetings with Music in Town and uh, with the neighbors, and there are so many issues the way the city is doing permitting in general. The, um, what happens to the children's school and the Grady High School, uh, when the streets are closed, how they can get the big equipment into the park. Um, can they bring it down near Park Tavern? Can they go over um, where the belt line is going to be? So it gets very granular, and I have been in those meetings, and there is, as I said, a lot to be done. The second thing is, it's the number of festivals that Piedmont Park absorbs. So it's not just Music Midtown. It is festivals every single weekend, and it is just, in my case, in my view, um, out of balance. Uh, we do have a lot of land in this town. We do have areas that are not near neighborhoods. We have tremendous areas where we have torn down public housing. And so we need, as we are going to build out transit, to be thoughtful where people can go, whether that is the quarry, whether that is southeast, whether that's on the west side, and have that vision for spreading this out and not having Midtown take the entire, and, and Virginia Island, and every neighborhood nearby taking that work. Ms. Willard, you did kick that off. And just for fun and to get things moving and, uh, and a little bit different, mix things up a little bit, I guess we could say. We're going to start with you on this next question and come back in this direction. So people in this part of town have a very intimate relationship with their trees. Uh, our tree canopy is one of the defining characteristics of the city. At 48% canopy coverage, we have the highest coverage of any city of our size nationwide. However, this asset, which can bring environmental, social, and economic benefits to all neighborhoods in Atlanta, is at risk. If you sign the canopy pledge, and what are your plans for preservation and expansion of the canopy? God have mercy on anybody in this room who doesn't know about the canopy play. <laughs> well, listen, I've been a tree hugger uh, for a long time, um, and I'm not changing now. Um, I actually haven't seen the canopy pledge, uh, but I'd be happy to sign it, I'm sure, because we came out of this neighborhood at, in all the years that I've been working here. I, I feel very confident that there wouldn't be anything that I would agree with. You know, one thing you didn't mention is the impact that our tree canopy has on stormwater reduction. You know, an average tree in this neighborhood uh, absorbs about 30,000 gallons a year. And when we talk about what the cost of, that we charge when somebody cuts a tree down, it's a nominal compared to what we have to pay to absorb the water once that tree is lost. So what I want to make sure we're doing is that we're calibrating the value of these trees to relate to what it would cost us if they were gone. And that includes heat index and all kinds of other things. So we'll start with that. Uh, but also I think with relative to neighborhoods as we're starting to see teardowns and things, you know, we want to make sure that you're not, A, you can't clear cut, and B, you know, you can build a house on top of the footprint just in case you thought, uh, you know, you couldn't. Um, and so we've got to be, really build visual about it. It's one of the things that's so incredibly special about our city, but it also does a lot. There's a tremendous economic value there. We need to that part of I was actually the first volunteer coordinator for Trees Atlanta in 1984, and Marsha Vance will back that up. Um, I have known how important this was for a very long time. I was involved in the first tree ordinance in, for the city, the, and the, the, what was not done was to connect our trees to the land value. 
So when we have recompense that is just a cost of doing business in areas where the land value and the, and the cost of, and the price of the house is going to just, it's nominal. And then you have other areas of the, of the city where it's prohibited to do anything. We have, um, as y'all remember, I was very involved in infill housing back 10 years ago because of the huge houses that were taking out every tree, um, wiping out the sunlight and the airflow from the, ne from the next door neighbor. And so I care passionately about that. We've had a revised tree ordinance that has been uh, not released to the public and has not been passed. It needs to be passed immediately and I will do so as the next mayor and also make sure that we are connecting land value to tree canopy because it is that important. God help me. I don't know about the canopy, but I hear about it. I think it's very important. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, I was, I picked my two daughters up from school one day. They're five and six years old. And my youngest daughter saw an excellent tree. Uh, and, she, and, and, and she said, Daddy, there's an excellent tree. My oldest daughter said, well, what's the X for? And I'm surprised my oldest daughter didn't know what my youngest daughter did. She said, they're going to cut that tree down. Uh, my oldest daughter nearly had a connection. She said, why are you cutting this tree down? But the point I make with that is, is that we've got to find ways to save trees, and we've got to go the extra mile to get it done. Uh, so rather than just clear cutting, we've got to ensure that when there's some development that's going to happen, or anything that's going to happen on the property, where there's a canopy, that we ask for of the developer to go the extra mile to save as many trees as possible. Uh, we've also got to make sure that we're planting as much as we can uh, and looking for places uh, and, and ways to plant in even creative areas. You know, cities like Chicago, they use even the buildings to plant trees on buildings. We need to do more of that here in the city. But I'm certainly very interested in seeing the canopy pledge. I grew up in the city of trees, and I love trees. I just signed it. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember if I signed it or not, but um, since Kathy has pulled it up, I'm sure I'll get a chance and I pass the microphone. <laughs> um, but I do think, I say a lot that we have to meet and enhance our communities at their point of need. And I also think that we have to educate our communities at their point of need. Quite frankly, in this city, there are many communities that can't get to the point of caring about trees because they're caring about basics. And by that I mean that we have to make the case, especially in many of our underserved communities, why you should care. It's not just about beauty. If I'm in an underserved community, I have four children who are asthmatic. If I, if I speak to a community in terms of what it means for our children and their ability to breathe clean air, that's a very different conversation and gives communities a reason to care. I had an opportunity um, earlier this year to plant trees with my seven-year-old daughter with Trees Atlanta. And she now has an appreciation and an education that she may not have otherwise had. So I think that um, we have to give all of our communities a reason to care because it's important to all of our communities. And I think that there's an opportunity, especially with our children, to create a mindset um, as it relates to our trees. So I'm in the same boat vis-a-vis -vis the tree, the tree pledge. Uh, I'm looking forward with bated breath to, to see the tree pledge and to and I'm looking forward to being able to sign it. I am very supportive of the goal of maintaining our tree canopy percentage. I would actually like to see us figure out what it would take to actually get to 50% tree canopy. I need to see how that would be done, but I'd, I'd like to see those figures. I think we need to, a lot of great ideas have been mentioned already. Uh, but I do think there are a couple things uh, in addition to what's been mentioned that we need to do. Uh, we do need to look at planting scale trees uh, where we can, larger trees, uh, if it's possible. Um, sometimes in developments, uh, you, you get the, the size of a tree, the caliber of a tree, which is, uh, you know, frankly, insufficient compared to what was lost. Uh, and so we need to do that. A second, we do need to have a sliding scale. Uh, for the tree ordinance, because right now you do have some developers that clear cut a lot without concern and pay the recompense, uh, and then you have other individuals that you know have a, a private home and want to take out one tree and can't afford to. So we do need to have a sliding scale. Castle Norwood. Yes. 
with the annexation of uh, uh, Emory CDC, the Atlanta Fire Rescue assumes a significant responsibility for the protection of that area. However, the firehouse and equipment that currently serve the area are not part of the deal. Is there an opportunity to renegotiate this deal to address this added burden on the City of Atlanta services? And if you want to comment more generally on uh, the Emory annexation, <coughs> please do so. Yes. And so, yes, now is the time to negotiate all of the details. Um, I have supported any annexation where there it is legal, accurate, and um, and the residents and the institutions wish to be part of the city. Uh, we need to know that we can provide the services. And as you know, the agreement was signed um, on the uh, DeCabs. Uh, uh, objection to having Emory and CDC and CHOA come into the city. So that um, agreement we did pass last council session, but there are still those other details to be worked out. Yes, I support the annexation. I think it's good for the city to have CDC, the CDC, uh, as well as Emory in the city of Atlanta. I think it speaks very well of the city. I think it represents a great opportunity. Uh, the fire station over in the area uh, was paid for by the people who live in the area. Uh, the folks who were coming into the city live in that area, and so that fire station should ultimately come into the city of Atlanta. Uh, that's just basic uh, math when it comes to annexation. So as mayor, uh, I'm going to continue to pursue the issues and ensure that those assets uh, are in the city of Atlanta and are controlled by the city of Atlanta. And I looked at the tree canopy. I think actually think I have a find this before, and I think I passed these cards out at my last council. <laughs> Um, but as it relates to annexation, I do support the annexation, and I think that it really is a testament to where we are as a city and how well and how stabilized the city is that people and world-class institutions are seeking to become a part of the city. But in addition to our services, like our fire services, et cetera, the big conversation we had, at least on the south side, was as it relates to our schools, and it's a very different issue in many of the northeast neighborhoods because people are seeking to come into Atlanta because of a thriving school district and one of the major challenges we had on the south side was that the school the school cluster was not a thriving cluster and people wanted to stay in Fulton County so that they did not have to come into APS. So again it goes back to this intersection of all of our issues as we're talking about annexation and world-class institutions and thriving neighborhoods wanting to become a part of the city, if we are not grounded out and if we aren't offering the best in each area, uh, then it really, we suffer as a city as a whole. So yes, I support the annexation. I also support the annexation of other areas. Uh, I'd love to see uh, South Fulton under the right circumstances. The new city of South Fulton joined the city of Atlanta. Uh, we have a broken revenue model. We have a broken uh, revenue model for the city. Uh, we're only 8% of the metro area. Uh, and I started looking at this back in 2001 with Mayor Franklin uh, before she was even inaugurated. Uh, we, are, we represent one of the smallest proportions of any major city of the metro population. Yet we have these vast daytime uh, populations that come in in costs. So we need to grow this city. One of the reasons why we're not investing in our roads and our parks and our sewers over the last many years is because of this broken revenue model. And so we, wherever we can, where it's fair to the people who are being annexed in and to the current residents, we need to make sure that we grow the city geographically and we need to grow the city in terms of population within its current boundaries because right now we're the least dense city in the US uh, and we have an opportunity for growth if we can do it in a balanced fashion. I said that I can't work here. <laughs> Let's 
forgot what the question was. Um, listen, here's how I feel about every annexation. Is before we even proceed to the question, I have to stand because my chair's not moving. Um, before we proceed to any annexation, we need to understand what's the cost of the annexation to the current taxpayers and what's the revenue that we're going to derive for that. It doesn't mean that every single time it has to be a positive cash flow situation, but if it's not, we need to know what that means. If you're going to come into the city of Atlanta, you come in and your kids go to our schools. Uh, in some places, that's you know we're, we have some concerns about you know maybe we're having overcrowding on the northeast side. But if that becomes the problem, then we either have to figure out how we're going to build more more schools with as a part of the annexation, or then the annexation isn't right for us. But we have to have a full set of facts before we move forward, and that's been what's so challenging about the Emory annexation and even the South Fulton annexation is that, is that we're not being deliberate, being very, very open, letting people know the time schedule and answering all the questions up front before the debate begins. Um, so that's how I feel about it. And we can renegotiate the deals as long as the council doesn't pass it before this term ends. Next question, and this is one from the audience that I think is on a lot of people's uh, minds, uh, Council President Mitchell. Uh, what will you do about the perceived corruption of airport contracts and vendors uh, relative to donors of campaigns? Well, first of all, I was the first candidate council person to stand up and, and make the strong suggestion and recommendation that all contracts that are non-emergency that, that don't expire until next year uh, be left in next year and handle the business of the day. Uh, that created a good bit of controversy, obviously, uh, and personal attacks upon me. Uh, but I stood firm on that. I still believe that because here's what's happened since. The former procurement officer uh, has pled guilty. Uh, we've had a contractor uh, to be identified as the one who actually bribed the uh, former procurement officer and the same contractor is applying. Uh, for four of these bids that should not even be up right now. When I'm mayor, we're going to create an independent compliance officer. And this person's role is going to be to root out waste, fraud, and abuse, and corruption in city government. And we're going to also make sure that our procurement process is online from beginning to end, from the issuance of the RFP uh, to the completion of the RFP and signing of the legislation by the mayor. We're also going to make sure uh, that if you are a whistleblower, you're going to be protected and there will be no retaliation against you. When I'm mayor, I'm going to bring corruption in city government and this current crisis of corruption to an end. I think there are several things that we need to do to make sure that there's confidence in our procurement process. The, th the first thing that we need to do, if it's not done before uh, January, is we need a complete audit of our procurement process so we can find out exactly where we are, and make sure that there are no issues, outstanding issues that have not been flagged yet. I also think that we need to move to an electronic bidding system. Right now, we are still a paper-based system. I've heard small businesses complain that it is often near impossible to bid on city contracts because it costs thirty to forty thousand dollars just to place a bid on a contract that the business may not receive. I also think that there's another layer that, um, as elected officials and people working in sensitive positions within procurement, I think that they need, we need to file our tax returns, make them available online along with our financial disclosures, and I think that adds another <coughs> layer of transparency. The first thing I'm going to do as mayor is personally train in groups of 100 to 200 every city employee on the ethics code, the ethics requirements of the city, and what I hope will be a new policy, which is a see something, say something, which is an affirmative obligation on the part of city employees. If you sign up to be a city employee, you should be required to report uh, misdeeds or questionable activities. Uh, there may be some legal questions around how we do that exactly, but as close as we can get to that, we need to be in a place where everybody feels empowered uh, to bring up these things. There's a number of other steps that we need to take. We do need audits of emergency procurements, but we need more than that. We need to have a database which lists every check the city's written, uh, every contract associated with it, the company that received it, and then a, a thing that a number of people leave out is who owns that company. We have a lot of shell companies or sort of single-use companies uh, out at the airport and elsewhere, and this is true in other cities as well. 
uh, we need to know who owns those companies. And so we need that data all online. We also need to tape the conversations, audio tape the conversations between vendors and procurement officials, and post the transcripts online. That is something other cities and states do. We can do that as well. I'm not going to be piecemeal about it. We're going to rebuild this from the ground up. And so what I want to say very, very clearly, as soon as I get there, I'm going to convene a group of uh, public and private experts in compliance and procurement so that we know thoroughly what we need to do, how we need to staff it, what kind of technology we need, how we can train our employees, everything that we need to do, because there's so many ways this can go wrong. It can go wrong from how we write the contract. It can go wrong by how we ev evaluate and bid the contract. It can go wrong when we pay the contract, because people do change orders quite regularly at the city of Atlanta. They bid low, then they come back and they want more money. So there's tons of things that we need to do from start to finish, but it also starts with the basics. You know, I want to talk about campaign finance reform. There is no reason that $2,600 needs to be the limit. It could be 100. People in other jurisdictions do it. And we could spend more time talking to you about the issues than sitting on the phone trying to figure out how we get ourselves on TV. I mean, we need to fundamentally change what this is. And it goes down to things as simple as you asked for us not to put yard signs illegally in your neighborhood, and people did it. Look at mine. I have a disclosure on there and a phone number. If you find one of mine in an illegal location, call me. I'll get it out of there. What I said is that I will bring in a procurement director who has been run procurement for a publicly traded company where every single procurement has been examined and is up for public review. It's the only way that we will absolutely start at the top and get this right. What I have seen in my year of campaigning and meeting with contractors, meeting with architects, meeting with engineers, both minority and majority, everyone to the person is saying to me, Mary, give me a level playing field. I will, I will participate. When we have contracts at the airport and there are only two bidders, something is bad wrong. So it will be fixed. It will, I will have an advisory council of people who do not have anything to gain, but I want every part of it fixed because we have not done this in a way, and the council has had no involvement with that. I actually got thrown out of the procurement office years ago when I tried to investigate what was going on. So we are only the legislative body. It is a broken system, and I will fix it. Councilwoman Bottoms, with the closing of the Peachtree Pine Shelter and other residential and support programs around the city, how will you work to address the issue of homelessness? I think that as we look at the issue of homelessness, we really have to make sure that we are getting to the root cause. So many of, of our homeless population have underlying issues. And as the need to decentralize homelessness um, is very clear. But I think that the burden of carrying our homeless population needs to be shared throughout the city, throughout each district in the city. I think what we have done at the Imperial Hotel on P Street is a great example of how we need to approach this issue. It's now a permanent supportive housing facility. If you are passing by, you don't know it and you shouldn't know it because it's about treating our homelessness, our homeless population with dignity, but also once we have shelter in place, shelter first, then being able to bring service providers in who can treat people and provide the services they need. The way that we treat a homeless veteran is very different than we the services we need to provide, say, to a mother of four. And so I think it's about providing services in place. So first let me talk about what I've already done. Uh, as a private citizen, a few years ago I helped found a nonprofit called Partners for Home. Uh, it helps coordinate the various service providers in the city uh, so that we provide coordinated intake and entry and so that we optimize the services and service providers that we have as best we can. But we need to go way beyond that. There's, uh, as part of the work with that organization, uh, we developed a plan with the Regional uh, uh, Commission on Homelessness uh, to raise $50 million, $25 million from the city, $25 million from the from private sector or philanthropy. 
Um, that plan needs to be implemented. The money is there and we need to use it on its intended purposes. So more low barrier shelters to replace the capacity of peach tree and pine, but smaller ones that are best in class. We need permanent supportive housing units that can address the substance abuse, mental health, and other issues that many of the homeless population have. Um, so there's a series of things that we need to do, and as mayor, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make sure we execute on those, because for too long we've had a disjointed system, we haven't cooperated enough with, with the county and the state, and that's gonna, that's gonna stop. You know, this is such a terrible problem uh, in our city and across this country because we, we do have federal and state decisions that complicate what's going on, right? No money for people with mental illness, no money to treat people with substance abuse. Uh, so we, we've got to deal with it, and the next mayor has to deal with real people, and we see it all the time. As I've been out on the campaign trail, you know, I had a guy who said, I want to have your phone number because I want to volunteer for your campaign. So I gave him my phone number, and he called me, and he said, you know, I'm, I, I need to talk to you because I'm, I, you know, I, I need a place to live. But he didn't want to say that in front of people. So I had I called back, and it was at a hotel, and, and he had left the room, so I, I haven't been able to find him. But this is the desperation. I've got a kid that, you know, is homeless herself, and she's looking for a place to live. And so folks are kind of, you know, coming up wanting this. So we have money. We have to focus on executing. We have a good coalition down at City Hall that's working and coordinating things. But as Peter said, it's time to start executing. We, you know, we can't just stand by and hope that the problem solves itself. And we have to work a lot with our county partners to make sure that we have those wraparound services, particularly for mental illness and substance abuse, and kids who are minors or, or just young people just over the age of uh, you know, adulthood, to make sure that, that they're getting what they, can, what they need to be able to stabilize their lives. The term homeless um, actually is four or five different components, has four or five different components. We have youth, we have families, we have veterans, we have the chronic homeless, and then we have people that either are homeless or are not, who are out on our streets, who are panhandling, who are wandering the streets. I'm not talking about the mental health issues, I'm talking about what we've seen across the city. Well, I have gotten involved over the years and have raised over a half million dollars to have people who want work in our town to be able to have it, both from the Georgia Department of Transportation and from private um, foundations. The mayor of Albuquerque has a program where if you want work that day, you can be a day laborer with his public works department, you can clean up the city, you can clean up parks, and you maintain parks, and you can get paid. So we need to separate out our mental health issues and do wrap it and um, get the wraparound services in supportive housing. We also, I'm out of time, uh, more to come. <laughs> yeah, the, our homeless crisis in the city is a serious one and it really deserves more than a minute. Uh, but it's going to take partnership. When I'm mayor, I'm going to make sure we're working with Fulton County, the school system, uh, and other public agencies to address this issue. We, we, this issue but we're also going to get the private sector involved. Uh, I, I, about a year or so ago, I worked with an organization called Westcare uh, to help leverage private sector investment by way of in-kind furnishing uh, to allow for veteran women uh, who have children who are homeless to be able to have a place to stay uh, in this city. Uh, that was a partnership. We also got to make sure that we're very much focused uh, on addressing this issue of housing first. Uh, the model has got to be one in which we provide you with housing first and then we work on the issues that may have made you homeless to begin with. Uh, the next thing I think we've got to do a much better job of is leveraging the resources that we have. The city is about to make a $50 million investment, 50 public, 50 private. We've got to make sure we're focused on groups uh, like LGBTQ youth and children who are coming out of foster care. Uh, I passed legislation to ensure that we make a real specific investment in them. And then the last thing, my wife, as my time is coming to a close, she teaches right here at Emmett Middle School. And she tells me that the population of children who are homeless in this school is higher than you might imagine. When I'm mayor, I'm going to focus on eliminating homelessness amongst children. That is going to be my top priority. Mr. Avery, another question from the audience. The relationship between the current mayor and the Atlanta Public School Board is tense. What will you do to strengthen that relationship?
relationship, so it benefits both the city and Atlanta Public School. Yeah, I've been saying for a long time uh, that as mayor, uh, I not only want to have a great relationship uh, with the school board and the superintendent, uh, but I believe the mayor needs to make sacrifices on behalf of the school system. Uh, we have not had a strong enough partnership, at least in the two decades I've lived here, uh, between the city and the school system, and that will change when I'm mayor. There, there have been a series of reasons for that. Uh, over time with things the city had to fix uh, internal to its own operation. But now is the time where we need to help the school system. So we're going to have a series of partnerships. We're going to have staff at each other's meetings. I'm going to talk frequently with the superintendent and school board. Uh, and beyond that, I am a strong proponent of early childhood learning, birth to age three or birth to age four. We need to make sure that's a component of the city. We need to make sure it's available to anyone who needs it, even if they can't afford it. The school system wants uh, to have that partnership. This will be something we fund philanthropically and partner with nonprofits. But I want to be the education mayor, and as I said, I'm willing to bet whether I have a second term or not on whether I can effectively partner with the Atlanta Public Schools and whether we can get on a pathway to having early child development available. Well, our, our city won't ever be successful unless we have schools that are successful. So we have to start with that as our basic premise. You know, when Shirley Franklin and I got elected at the same time, we were the first two women uh, to hold our respective offices. And, and instinctively, we began to work together. We met weekly, and we agreed not to disagree with each other in public, or at least not to, you know, kind of argue with each other in public. Um, and that was a very successful uh, relationship that we had together. I still held her accountable. I still did the work that we needed to do to make sure that they got their work on the administration side done, but I didn't feel like I needed to throw bombs to, to interrupt her progress. When I, got, when I decided to get into this race, I called Maria Karstoffin and I said, look, I want to meet with you. And she said, well, what's the hurry? It's a couple years out. And I said, I want to meet with you because we need to have a relationship so that we can start planning how to build a successful city together. I have to build healthy communities around schools. I need to make sure that the infrastructure is there, that works, that the after-school programs for kids work, and that when she's planning on closing a, sco uh, a, a school and I'm planning on densifying that same community, we're you know, not working against each other in our long-range plans. I met with the, with the superintendent and I was with her this morning when she spoke to the Buckhead Business Association. I've been a member there for many years. The um, school, the school deeds uh, were just the tip of the iceberg on how the city has not been a good partner with the school system. One of the things that she explained to me was when there is an emergency, um, they are not in the loop. The city notifies a lot of different entities about what their plans are, but when they had the collapse of the bridge, she got no information. So she's trying to make a decision about the children and where the buses are going to be the next morning and she was never given the phone call. So she and I sat down and talked about eight different um, ways that the city could be helpful, and I agreed with her with all of those. I am a collaborator, I am not confrontational, and so I will work with her daily to make sure that we are in lockstep. My first executive order is gonna be to hand over, hand over all the deeds. First thing I do, bottom line. Uh, and I'm going to do that because I think it's very important given the nature of the relationship right now between uh, the executive branch and the school system. It's so bad that we've got to show, make a real show of good faith. Uh, for me, I'm not going to have to go and introduce myself to the superintendent. We talk all the time. I'm not going to have to go and introduce myself to school board members. We talk and we partner all the time. Uh, the relationship that I have now is one I'm going to build upon. For 12 years, I've had a program called the College Prep Series. I do that in partnership with APS and other community organizations. It's about getting kids ready for college and career, and now we've served over 7,000 kids and their families in this school to get them ready for college and career. When I'm mayor, we're going to build upon that with programs that, like after school, programs that allow young people to get prepared for career, learn how to code, learn how to build something. Uh, from my perspective, if we don't have a strong partnership with the school system, and if we're not hand-in-hand, hand, locked together, 
or we're not going to be able to get the great things done that we need to do in this city. I'm not going to need to create a relationship. I already have it, and we're going to build upon it. I am a graduate of Frederick Douglass High School, and I also am the mother to four school-age children. So the issue of education is very personal to me, as I know that it is to all of our communities. But I, this is the reason I'm committed to appointing a director of education, because I think there needs to be a designated person within City Hall who is responsible for making sure that we are partnering well with our school. This does not mean that, as mayor, I will not partner with our superintendent because I think that's extremely important. But I think there needs to be a focused day-to-day -day, um, partnership with our schools. Also, I was a judge for six years, and the thing that always struck me is that when people came in asking for public defenders, the vast majority of them had not completed ninth grade. They have to fill out an, an application. Although we don't have direct oversight over our schools, I believe as a city we pay either on the front end or on the back end. And so when I'm out of time, I'll finish talking about that later, I hope. <laughs> back down to the question to Ms. Wooler. Uh, and there are a lot of questions about this. Uh, the, the, Voters here want to know what you're going to do to recruit and retain a fully staffed and equipped police force. And in particular, we're currently authorized for 2,000 officers, but the actual number of employees is closer to 1,700. What do you believe is the right number of officers to effectively police the city with the size of the crime issues of Atlanta? So when Shirley and I were at City Hall, we said it was 22 to 2,500 police officers. We're now at 1660 or something like that. I believe we're in the red zone here, folks. You know, that we are so low uh, that we can't adequately cover things. And we had two emergencies in town, or maybe one big emergency in town, uh, that we wouldn't have the, the person power uh, to, to do what we need to do to make sure that people are kept safe or to address whatever's going on. So that's a, that's a really urgent problem. The good news is, is we've got money. So we have got to make sure that we're calibrating all of our recruit pay as well as our, uh, our step pay all along the way uh, because we are falling behind the region and that's our first problem. Secondly, uh, benefits, making sure our benefits are competitive and including providing people places to live in the city uh, and cars to take home uh, would go a long way to matching the benefits in other areas. But I'll commit right now to building a new training facility for our police and fire department because right now it's in an old school down by a parking lot underneath the airport uh, and it is not the kind of place that anybody would want to come to work and think that they're at a professional facility and we don't have a firefighter's facility at all. When I got back on city council, I was stunned to see that the police still were having major issues with the salary increases that they had deserved. The administration was having a, um, was being confrontational, I'll put it that way, with the unions, and it was taken out on the men and women of the force. I put in legislation, and it took a year and a half to get it passed, but I put in legislation to give them the adjustments that they had been denied, and the reason was this. Number one, they deserved it, but number two, in 2011, we lost 50 police officers. When I came back on city council in 14 and started this process, in 2015, we lost 158. In 2016, we lost 160. In 2017, we're losing 14 to 16 a month. 82% of them say, it's the pay. It's not all the rest of it, it's the pay. So we do have the money, we do have excess reserves, and we need to pay these men and women. We have a very young department, we need to have the stability in that department, and it is paid. My father was an Atlanta police officer, and he, while on the force and in his short lifetime, uh, he was able to fight successfully for equal pay, equal promotions uh, for African-American women police officers in the police department. Uh, but he also did community policing. Uh, and I truly believe if we're going to have a strong police force, we certainly have to increase the numbers of police officers, but we have to change also the way we do policing. 
Uh, we also, on, on top of that, with respect to our police officers, we've got to increase their pay, but also reduce the cost of being a police officer. Uh, and that's why I formed a couple of years ago something called an Employee Task Force on Compensation. Uh, and out of that task force came legislation such as longevity pay, providing training incentives and benefits for police officers and other employees, uh, additional uh, benefits that allow them to feel good about being on the force. When I'm mayor, I'm going to make sure we pay them, police officers, a competitive salary so that we're not fighting with other jurisdictions. I'm also going to make sure that if you're a police officer and you rip uh, your uniform, you're not going to have to pay for that. You're going to be able to go to the quartermaster and get one. Uh, you're going to be able to take your car home if you live inside the city. You're going to be able to find affordable housing so that the cost of being a police officer goes down while your pay goes up. What we are seeing in the city of Atlanta really is being felt across the country as there is so much unrest. Um, law enforcement agencies are having a difficult time recruiting officers because people just aren't interested in being police officers in the way that they were, say, 10 years ago. Our ideal number is 2,500. We need to get back to 2,000 immediately. But 2,500 if we want our officers to be able to patrol and enforce. Uh, but there is also an opportunity for us to expand in the area of technology. In areas that we have seen the security cameras go up in the communities, we've seen a significant decrease in crime. 38% on the west side along the Camelton Road corridor, 20 per, upwards of 20%. So there are other things that we can also do, but I think it's also about having our officers have buy-in in our community. Right now, only 20% of the police force lives in the city of Atlanta. That's an affordability issue. I think there are things we can do to provide incentives, housing stipends, education stipends, and also take home cars. So about uh, 14 years ago, as a private citizen, when I was doing the pro bono work with Mayor Franklin, I helped her start the Atlanta Police Foundation. And since that time, that organization has actually been the key force implementing the license plate readers and the cameras in the city. We now have uh, around 10,000 cameras. We do need to work on technology. Um, but let me tell you, as Chief Operating Officer in 2010 and 11, I, you know, I would go to a homicide scene about every three or four weeks. And I would stay for several hours. And I'm in awe of what our police force does. And having worked closely with the police chief, there is no question that we need more officers and that they need to be paid more. Uh, the ultimate target is around 23 to 2,500. Uh, to get there, we have to get to 2,000 first. To do that, we have to pay them competitively. This is not rocket science. We know what the competitive pay is in jurisdictions. We have to make sure that we are paying our officers fairly. We also need to provide them take-home cars. That is another benefit other jurisdictions provide. Uh, if we do those things, uh, we can match. Uh, certainly when I was COO, we had some of the two best years in recent memory in recruiting and retention. Uh, and we can match that if we put the resources into the pay. Councilwoman Norwood, we are close to the end of the evening, so we're going to go uh, have one last round of questions, beginning with you, and then we'll have two minutes for closing statements from each of you. And if each of you could please deduct from that two minutes any extra time that you took in the last <laughs> question. There you go. Like, like your man. Uh, housing, particularly near the Beltline, which was affordable a decade ago, was being demolished by developers and replaced by mega mansions or luxury townhomes and condos. What are your plans for encouraging the preservation and creation of affordable housing at all income levels? Well, one of the things that has happened, um, yes, we've had gentrification pressure around the Beltline, but we the Beltline touches 45 neighborhoods. There are actually 252 neighborhoods in the city. One of the things that we can do for affordable housing is we have 10,000 vacant units, of ha um, 10,000 buildings, uh, houses and apartment buildings that were mortgage frauded, and they go along a wide swath in our city that goes from no, uh, the northwest part to the southwest part. You can actually see the map here. Um, one of the things that we can do now because of a change in the state law that I worked on is to have those houses taken to and given to our land bank authority. We can take that property 
that is abandoned and blighted and can renovate it and turn it into affordable housing for city workers, for um, teachers and others that we want in our community. Secondly, we need an employer-assisted workforce housing program so people can be closer to where they work, which will help with our transportation as well. We need every single income strata working with the Atlanta Housing Authority for the 15% um, AMI going up to 30% and then working with the Invest Atlanta. There are a lot of tools that Invest Atlanta has to get people in homes across the city, uh, down payment assistance, owner-occupied rehab to, uh, for seniors and others to fix up their houses, and my time really is up. Okay. <laughs> Don't start my time yet, I gotta make a statement. We've been to about 50 forums together. We can each give each other's introductions <laughs> and all of our policies together. So, Barry just talked about the idea of getting vacant and abandoned homes and actually uh, taking possession of them. Uh, it's a program that I call Blight to Light. Go to my website and you'll see it. Uh, and we both share the same concern about eliminating blight, uh, but taking that blight and turning that into the light of affordability in this city. When I'm mayor, we're going to make that happen. Uh, and we're going to turn these homes that, were, that are blight on our community, bringing our neighborhoods down into places where teachers and police officers and firefighters uh, nurses in the creative class can live. That's the kind of project initiative that I'm going to do as mayor. Also, we're going to go and work with the Atlanta Housing Authority. We're going to work with MARTA. We're going to work with the school system to use the land that they have to create affordability in the city in a way that we haven't done before, along the scale of affordability from 30% of AMI to 120%. Uh, that, so that a young professional couple will have the ability to buy a home in the city and live close to where they work. Uh, we're also going to have to lean in on policy. Uh, we're going to have to have policies like inclusionary zoning, policies that really allow for us to prevent our senior citizens and long-term residents from being taxed out of their home because we're creating uh, safety valves uh, for tax increases for our senior citizens and long-term residents. So we're going to have to do partnership. Uh, we're going to have to do projects, uh, and we're going to have to put in place some really solid um, um, uh, policies, policies, projects, uh, and partnerships with the way we're going to increase affordability in the city. And we've got to start with the Beltline. The legislation for creating inclusionary zoning around the Beltline is in the City Council. We've got to get that passed so that the Beltline uh, can lead the way in terms of producing more affordability in the city. Thank you. I mentioned earlier the displacement free zones that I asked that the city create to um, address affordability. But another part of that is a plan that I announced a couple of weeks ago, and it's a $1 billion affordability plan. And it sounds extremely aggressive, and that is because it is, but it is also doable. $500 million in private investment. Uh, we already see $250 million coming at Turner Field, so we know that there's an interest in true investment in that area, but also $500 million in public investment, meaning uh, coordination between City of Atlanta, uh, the Recreation Authority, Invest Atlanta, MARTA, all of our public partners who own public land in this, in this city. But I think that our goal really has to be getting towards establishing 50,000 units of, of affordable housing. Affordable and workforce housing so that school teachers and police officers and the people who drive our garbage trucks are actually able to live in the city. This is not just an issue for people struggling to make ends meet, but also for our businesses in the city as well as they seek to uh, create, have a workforce that lives in the city. So I mentioned before, we are forcing out of Atlanta the very people that built Atlanta. I don't believe this is acceptable either morally or practically. So there's several things that we have to do. First, we have to recognize that the next mayor has a once-in-a-generation opportunity to rezone the city, as I said. That zoning needs to have inclusionary elements and incentives so that we create affordable housing. On top of that, there's probably 15 different tools that you can use to drive affordability. There's community land trusts, there's community development corporations, uh, there's site-specific negotiations around project systems cost to, to create affordable units. There's a lot of sophisticated tools that we have a power that we have the power as a city to implement. As mayor, I will bring both the will to work on affordable housing as well as the skill to work on these complex initiatives uh, to make sure that we have affordability 
And having built up so many budgets for the city of Atlanta over two administrations, uh, I will know how to find the money to pay for this because make no mistake, if you want to work on affordable housing, you have to be able to fund those initiatives. Try to say something fresh and new after uh, all of this, but um, the displacement really is real, and so our first priority has got to be to be putting up um, uh, housing for people who are at the lowest uh, part of the income scale because the displacement's real. They're moving out now. Houses are being flipped, and there's no place for them to go. The Atlanta Housing Authority tore down nearly a dozen uh, housing complexes and now owns about 500 acres of land across the city, but it hasn't been built on in over a decade. So we've got to start building and we've got to give local preference to the people who are being uh, priced out of their neighborhoods because their entire economic and social support system exists within that neighborhood. Um, I want to implement a commercial parking tax. We talked about that when I was on council representing District 6 where we're parking, we're uh, having a daily uh, tax on commercial parking spaces and use that as a dedicated revenue source to build housing at an array of incomes, particularly in areas near transit, so people can combine that housing affordability with uh, not having to own a car and being able to use transit to get around. Thank you. Let's begin the closing statements now to Cesar Mitchell of the state. Well, again, thank you all for being here this evening. This really just exemplifies your love of the city, your love for this community, and your hope for our city to be the best place in the world. Uh, and that's why I'm running for mayor. I want Atlanta to be the best place in the world for every child that's growing up in this city, every senior citizen who's sacrificed all their lives to make this city the city that it is, and every young family in between that wants to pursue the American dream right here in the city of Atlanta. You know, I was born and raised right here in the city. My mom was a public school teacher right here in APS. My father, as I mentioned, was an Atlanta police officer. He passed away when I was nine years old, uh, but he left a strong legacy of leadership and service. Uh, and that's why I'm running for mayor. I want to make sure that I use every bone in my body uh, to lead this city, to lead this city without leaving, leaving anyone behind. So when I'm mayor, we're going to get really focused on making sure that we are a strong partner with APS. And we're going to make sure that educational outcomes for our young people are better than they, better tomorrow than they are today. Uh, and I've got to do that because my wife, she's a committed educator right here in this school. And she fights every day to make sure that every child in this school has that kind of opportunity. And I want to make sure we do that throughout the entire city. I want this city to be an opportunity city. If you're a person who has a dream to have, to have a great job, that job can become a career. City government is going to work hard with you to ensure that you can bridge from job to career. But then also, if you want to bridge from career uh, to true entrepreneurship, the city government that I lead will be one that is your partner and gets out of the way when it's time for you to spread your wings. But also, I'm going to be very committed to ensuring that we have a stronger quality of life. Because I believe when opportunity goes up, crime goes down. And when crime goes down, quality of life goes up. So I'm going to make sure we have the cleanest city in America when I'm mayor. I'm going to make sure we have the safest large city in America when we're mayor by having true community policing on the ground. Uh, we're going to make this city the kind of city that we can all be proud of. But it's going to take leadership, which I have. It's going to take a real track record, which I have. And it's going to take the kind of temperament from the top that not only leads, but works well with others and sets a new tone in city government. I'm Cesar Mitchell. I don't want to be your mayor. I want to serve as your mayor. Thank you for having me. I hope you have your vote. Thank you. I often joke that I have in-town envy, and I actually do, because you all have an incredible neighborhood, and you have an incredible community. And when I compare what's happening in town, and we compare it with what's happening in other parts of our city, it really highlights why we are a city out of balance. In town, quite frankly, your families will have an experience that my family and my children don't have. I live in an NPU that does not have a park. And so my children don't know what it means to walk out of the door to a park or to have ice cream or to walk to a restaurant or to walk to a grocery store. I think that this community really is what we are all looking to have throughout the city. And again, it goes back to starting with quality schools 
And I think that when we balance out our city, we balance out our schools and our opportunity throughout the city, then I think that you will see relief in your traffic and many of the issues that ail this community. I drove back and forth to the children's school sometimes two, three, four times a day for many years when my children uh, were at the children's school because the schools in my cluster were not thriving schools. I know that the same things that you want for your community and your families really are what people want throughout this city. You want quality neighborhoods. You don't want, ha want to have to spend your life in your car. You want your communities to be safe and you want to be able to walk out your door and enjoy your community. That is why I'm running for mayor. I think that when we focus and make sure that each community throughout this city is truly a destination community, that it really will balance us out as a city and it will improve all of our lives. I say that there are four reasons I'm running for mayor and that's my four children. Lance, Langston, Lincoln, and Lennox. I want this city to be a great city for them. I want their community to be a great community. But I know that it can't be that for them if it's not for your families and your communities as well. I do hope that I am able to earn your support. Thank you. So again, my name is Peter Amon. This is the first time I've run for public office. Uh, but I do have three things that distinguish me uh, from the others on this panel. Experience, ethics, and leadership. I have the experience of having had a mom who was a school teacher and then went on to the local library board and the public school board where I went to school. A dad who was on the town council for a dozen years and a childhood where every night at the dinner table we talked about what made cities and towns great and how government could work for the benefit of people. I have had the experience of 25 years in the private sector working with some of the world's largest and most complex organizations and helping them improve on customer service and operations and budgeting. I have the experience of having worked with the city of Atlanta over the last 15 years. First, many years with Mayor Franklin doing pro bono consulting and helping her fix the city's biggest problems. And then two years actually running the city. So I'm the only person on the stage who's actually run the operations on a day-to-day -day basis of the city. So I have those experiences. Ethics. I ran uh, our ethics program globally for Bain & Company. So across dozens of countries for seven years, rebuilt and ran an ethics program focused on compliance. At the city, whenever I saw an issue, I had it investigated and I held people accountable. My first year alone, unfortunately, we had to terminate a number of individuals from the watershed department. And these weren't for criminal acts, but they were knowingly violating the code. And finally, leadership. I have a demonstrated track record of bringing together the nonprofit sector with the for-profit sector, with the neighborhoods, with uh, all of us together to make things happen, whether that was helping found Partners for Home to work on homelessness, helping found the Atlanta Police Foundation, helping found the West Side Future Fund, the Atlanta Committee for Progress, serving on the Woodruff Arts Center Board, or any number of other activities. Again, my name is Peter Amon. I would love to earn your vote. Thank you. You know, I've been sitting here all evening looking out and, and seeing so many faces that were uh, folks that I served when I was on the city council. Uh, I can remember being in this room for many community meetings as we argued and agreed and came to some solutions about how we would grow things in this neighborhood, which was one of the gentrifying neighborhoods of the city at the time. And that's how we came together to figure out that the belt line might be a way to orient density, not in our neighborhoods, but around a transportation corridor that would give us a great city, that would give us arts and parks and ways to get around and, and, and ways to orient development in a, in a way that worked for everyone. Um, You'll remember when I was on city council that I had great staff that were responsive to you and that I was here and present and doing work with you all the time. You'll remember that when I chaired the city's transportation committee, I stopped the dirty deal down at the airport where we had contractors that were trying to uh, get a special deal and extra payment and we stopped it and we sent people to jail as a result of that because I dogged it out until we got to the bottom of the situation. I left office to go to Congress to try to get transportation dollars because I am committed to transit on the Beltline. If we don't have a transportation-oriented city, we've got nowhere to grow. 
Um, and I'm back now because I'm not happy with the poor quality of development, the fact that we haven't had a planning department to speak of for the last decade that has been able to shape how we're going to grow, and I want to be a part of that at this point in time. So that's why I'm fighting for ATL, affordability, transportation, and livability. And I hope for those of you that have been a part of this neighborhood for years, that you'll talk to the folks who are new to the neighborhood to tell them about the things that we did together because there were a lot of things. But finally, I want, I want you to remember that I was an ethical person when I served in city government. I never had an ethics complaint. I didn't spend city hall funds to send mailings to people during campaign season. I have always conducted myself as a person who tries to be honest and forthright, even if it's not what you want to hear. You can expect that from me as mayor. I want to be the mayor of Atlanta so that we can have the ATL that we've always wanted to have, and I hope that you'll vote for me. Thank you. And as you know, I have been serving you for three terms on city council. I have been protecting communities and preserving neighborhoods over my 25 years of being both a community advocate as well as a city council member. It's really important to me, looking to the future, that we have a chief executive officer in this city, a mayor, who will run this city with honesty, with transparency, with accountability, with fair play, making sure that the politics are out of city government. We have a city government that is rife with politics, and that is all that I will say. But in a Norwood administration, that will not be the case. I want to protect you, I want to protect your quality of life. I want this entire city to thrive. I want it to be sustainable, I want it to be green, I want it to have mobility and connectivity. I want everyone to enjoy the best of Atlanta. Our people are better than our politics. Our politics at City Hall are not good. Let me tell you, I have been there, I have seen it. I ran for mayor eight years ago because I realized I needed to be the mayor to make the city work the way you deserve and expect. I came back to City Hall, I saw and realized I needed to run for mayor to do that for you now. If you will elect me your mayor, you will have a city that will shine and that you will be proud of, that we all will be proud of. I hope to have your vote, I hope to be your mayor. Thank you for being here with all of us tonight. Thank you. And can you please give a round of applause to Tom Baxter? What a great job.